after we got them licensed, nobody had made a sale because they couldn't figure out how to sell. But I was making enough sales for the division. We still led the nation by myself. On the 66th day, I used to call him Bill Clarahan, made a sale. It and then Clarahan was the stupidest of the group. And it became infectious. Then they all made sales. In this human system is a do-it-yourself project. You make yourself not comfortable. Nobody else. You do it to yourself. Now, some people say that I, I help that process along because I can make people pucker up. And that's probably true. I can. And the only reason I can make them pucker up is because I bring it, the hammer down on the nail and I point out without this I'm okay, you're okay crap, what you're doing wrong based on if you want super success. And I don't care what you think. I don't care if you like me. It doesn't make a difference to me. It just doesn't. Because my job, as I define it, not as you define it, as I define it, is to get you to be, as Joe Batten said, all you can be. And if I've got to drag you, kick you, mug you, hijack you, sodomize you, doesn't make any difference to me. It doesn't make any difference to me. Because I don't care if you like me or not. I just, I'm better off if you don't like me. Because friends are problems. I don't need any new friends. Anxiety is fear's little brother. Anxiety is fear's little brother. I can't remember the last time I got tense about anything other than a four-foot putt. <laughs> I mean, that's about it. That's about the only thing I get high anxiety over. And I'm getting better at making four-foot putts. But as Craig would, Mr. Hoffman in the back here would tell you, I missed the whole slew of them in the, in, the, in the year or two we've been playing golf together. Because for most people, this, this group included, success is as frightening as failure. Because to be super successful, as I've alluded all yesterday and so far today, comes a lot of pressure that you put on yourself. I mean, super successful people don't look like you, don't act like you, don't dress like you. I mean, when I get on a panel of 10 purported gurus of the, of the a personal development business they don't look like me it's like I, I told the joke in San Diego Don Taylor who is the chairman of VR brokers uh, who's a guy about 10 years older than I am Ed's dad successful guy made a lot of money he's thinking grow slow by Don Taylor he took a lot of years to get make a, he's got a lot of money though but he's taking a lot of years to do it and we go to a restaurant and uh, he talks to the maitre d', the hostess, the waiter, everybody before I get there. I want the bill. Taylor wants it. I sit down when, the, when, the, when the, it's time to pay the check, they hand the bill to me. I've never been out to dinner since I'm 30 years old that the bill didn't come to me. Because I look like the guy that should pay the bill. And I've been out with a lot of high-powered people. In my life, since I'm 30 years, actually since I'm 31. Since I'm 31 years old, for 18 years, they, they bring me the bill. Because I look like the guy that ought to pay the bill. I look like the most successful, I act like the most successful, whether they're my age or not my age, younger or older. And it's, I, I don't have, you know, I don't have any halo, I don't think. All the gin I had last night probably killed off my halo. But I mean, because I feel comfortable, one, pain. I feel comfortable writing checks. I don't get high anxiety over it. Because I realize it's easy to make money. And as my, one of my great idols, Sir Winston Churchill said, Success is never final. Here he won the Second World War. He was instrumental in the UK not caving in the Second World War. And as soon as the war was over, they threw his ass out of government. For those of you that follow stuff like that, they threw his fat little chunky ass out of, out, out of office. Because glory is fleeting, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing's forever. Nothing. Either a bad, 
bad putting stroke, Craig, or Richard, who just walked in in the back there, nothing's forever. Success or failure. Nothing's forever. Yes, sir. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Craig. Would you please, so we can memorialize this for time eternal. So we can, you know, your lovely children. Yes. Okay. I just had a question about, do you view constant personal net worth risk a necessary ingredient to super success? Do you have to put it on the line all the time, continually? Not or continu not at all? No. The answer to the question is, one, you don't have to put it continually. But you have to. There's times in a, in, in, in a, in a life cycle of a business or an idea that you've got to suck up your pantyhose, okay? And you've got to put it on the line. And, uh, but it's not always money. Sometimes it's time. You know, when I traveled those 242 days in 1987, I didn't have any money on the line, but I sure as hell had a lot of time on the line. One time somebody, you know, in, in my, my, my time is valuable. I was somebody once figured out how much money I made on a year, I mean an hour, and uh, the, uh, my time is valuable, so you have to put that on the line. But more than money, it's a commitment to a mindset change. It's a commitment to not hang around with doofuses, not be represented by morons. It's a commitment to surround yourself with winners. That's much harder than putting your net worth on the line. Because that's part of that emotional checkbook I told you you had. Not the financial. Financial checkbook's easy. It's the emotional to change your whole damn life around. You know, you've heard me say this. I mean, I've never talked to my neighbors where I live. And when the one doofus lady keeps talking to me when I'm down there hitting golf balls on my putting green, I guess, why? Doesn't the lady get the message? I don't want to talk to her. I, you know, I've been there since 1987. I never talked to him. That should send a pretty clear message. You'd think. But she, isn't she married to a YPO guy? I don't know. I know. I, yeah, that's probably he, she didn't get it. Anyway, it's that's the commitment. It's not the financial. It's the emotional checkbook you got to write. The Verdiers last night, or yet, yeah, yeah, last night set up here. They haven't been home a weekend since when? June or one or two weekends? Have we been home since June? First of September. Since the first of September, and the uh, and that's a commitment because they've got little kids. They got a doofus little dog who's kind of goofy, and I mean, that's a big commitment. That's where you fall short in the equation for high, be, being a high performance person. It's not, it's not the net worth. That's secondary. That's secondary. But you will have to, you know, I, there's, a, there's a portion coming up in the seminar where I say anybody uh, uh, guarantor is a, pool, a fool with a pen. But you're going to have to guarantee things. When I had a business until, it, you know, we, after we went public, then I didn't have to guarantee anything. But prior to that, I always had a guarantee because I was the one that had the deep pockets, not the company. So it's the emotional commitment. I mean, Secondarily, it's the financial commitment. And the reason why it's hard, it's difficult, it's almost impossible to make that emotional commitment because we know intellectually in our hearts, success is never final. No matter how successful we are, we know there's a chance that somebody's going to take it away. And that's why we choose, rationally choose not to write that emotional check and then not write the financial check because we really can't take it emotionally. One of my partners, um, well, I have a history of partners that go against me or screw me. They either die or get cancer or whatever, but or bankrupt. And there's one right now, I got a phone call from a, a guy I know in Houston who told me that his administrative assistant ordered a Tony Roma's ribs the other night. And the guy that came to deliver it is the former vice chairman of my company. <laughs> This guy, there's not a person in this room that wouldn't sell his child for the money that he made with me. That's a big tumble down. 
There's not a person in this room. He made a ton of money. We didn't count it. We had to weigh it. <laughs> Richard, you know who I'm talking about. Tony Romas. And when she opened the door, he was bent over, picking up the things from the ground. And when he stood up like this, wearing those white, uh, red shorts and a little uh, vest and a pointed hat. <laughs> and her name was Carol. Carol said, I couldn't talk. And he was embarrassed. And I just gave him $50. It was about an $18 thing, and I closed the door. She says, I didn't know what to do. Because that's what we're afraid of. That's why you don't do it. That's why. And the reason you're afraid is because, for those of you that got, and there's some successful people in this audience, for those of you that have made success, you're not sure exactly whether you deserve it, if you did it by accident, or you did it by design. Now, I haven't used this word all during the summer. I'm going to use it now. There's no way that I did mine by accident. And I know it. Uh-oh. My little doofus test <laughs> tells me I'm supposed to make it. Ch and because I know I didn't make mine by accident, oil went from 40 to 8 not from 8 to 40. Now, if I were Peter Drucker or, um, or Tom Peters and I put a chart up like that and we'd sit around, or if I was at a YPO deal, I'd get up and we'd talk about the organization and how we, uh, the global economy and social trends and technological development and the political climate and all this make up the general environment, actually. And we've got customers, competitors, suppliers, unions, stockholders, regulars, and interest groups. And vis-a-vis -vis this and pontificate bullshit, that, blah, blah. This is all crap. People in this room, that doesn't mean spit. You're reading your, your Rick Scott running Columbia, some of this makes sense. But until you're Rick Scott, forget all this, because it doesn't mean spit. Doesn't matter who's in office, who's out of office, whether the doofus Clinton's in, or I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Remember, it doesn't matter what the morons say. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't. And you, you buy books, you buy tapes, you go listen to people to hear this crap. It gripes the hell out of me, if you haven't noticed. That's why I do this. The global economy's got about as much to do with you as the Pope has to do with me. The only relationship is I'm a Roman Catholic, that's it. Yet you buy books and you, I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, P.T. Barnum was right. There is a moron sucker born every single minute, probably every second, every microsecond. I used to ask the question, how many write read books like this? But I don't do that anymore because it's too embarrassing for you and it's too debilitating to me. <laughs> I just can't take it anymore. I just can't. I mean, it's, it makes me crazy. I mean... And, and, and yet, yet I, get, I get comments, I get comments why I, how do unions interface with, how do I, that's a, that's a different question. I know how to deal with unions because I've dealt with unions because I was in the coal business. But I mean the global economy and it just, it's like, I, I give the analogy. Remember three or four years ago the killer bees started in South America, remember? And they'd come over from Africa or someplace, I don't know, the moon or Mars or someplace. And by the year 1995, excuse me, 1994, the killer bees were going to engulf North America. Remember that? Now, whatever happened to those killer bees? They shot a bunch of them. Yeah, well, yeah, but eight of them. <laughs> they, they, they stopped for about 10 or 12 or 15 months at the border. For some reason, they stayed on that side of the, the, the Rio Grande River or something, I don't know, because they like killing off illegal aliens, I guess, I don't know, poor, poor Hispanic uh, men and women. But, I mean, that, that's what happens. 
those killer bees were supposed to eat our lunch, remember? Never happened, did it? Now, I'm a believer that this ozone thing, that's never going to happen either, other than in the movies. Because you go back in the newspapers and you read, if you want to ha have a lot of fun, go back to the library and read Wall Street Journals 5, 10, 20 years ago. And you read the columns. The worst, the worst recession in recent memory. Now, how many times can we have the worst recession in recent memory? And, uh, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, all that is it's not important. It just isn't. It just isn't. You have to think about who writes all those articles, don't you? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Who writes all those articles? <laughs> Most of which have not a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. And, you know... Back in 1985 and 86, they, they even said that AIDS was going to kill everybody in the world. Yeah. In 1991 or two. That's exactly true. It's not going to happen. And I'm here to tell you that even though at some level, I hope all of you have to be concerned with this, at some level, when you're all Rick Scotts running a company that's doing 16 to $20 billion a year in revenue and you control the health industry, He's got, and even Rick doesn't care about this. He's got a couple guys on his staff that, you know. Rick, I mean, and Rick's a very bright lawyer, but I don't, I'm not sure Rick can spell organization. I mean, he went to TCU for law school. I mean, how smart can he be at t TCU law school, Jerry? He's obviously not a Harvard man. Okay. Before we get to that, let's see, I have to take my watch off, when I get all hyped up, my, we're going to take a, a short five minute break, Taylor, is that what you've been trying to tell me the last 25 minutes, what do we need breaks for? Ladies and gentlemen, you are the problem in your business, you are the, the moronic doofus, you are the short hitter. You are the weak stick. You are the idiot leading the troops. There's no doubt in my military or civilian mind. Zero. When I, when I hear about companies going out of business, there was 99,000 companies that went out of business, filed chapter 11 or 7, I think, in the last quarter or something. Maybe it was the last month. Maybe it was the last week. I don't remember what I... But anyway. All 99,000 companies will have a reason, interest rates, this, a big conglomerate, and it all went out of business because of mismanagement. All. Because we can go to those yellow pages and we can find all the companies, remember, that didn't go out of business in the same industry. Oil went from 40 to 8, I went from 0 to 400 and plus million dollars. 11,000 energy companies went out of business when I was doing those that growing. Yes, ma'am. Don't you think that's where the fear comes in? Because you know if you're the owner, CEO, and it's not working, it's because you're not working either. Yeah, well, I mean, that's part of it. Part, see, intellectually, subconsciously, we know that. There's very few people in this room that can admit to themselves or get up here and say, the reason my company is me. The reason my marriage is screwed up is me. Lack of self-worth, lack of self-esteem, lack, I mean, you know what you're going to, by Saturday, like this young lady got it really quickly, which I talked about, I was telling my wife about this. When you leave here Saturday evening, you're going you're to come away with four or five main thoughts. But one of those main thoughts should be, the reason I'm not a high-performance person is I really don't feel good about myself. Cut all the BS away. That's one. Two, and part of that is the enemy is here and it's me. I'm not where I want to be or where I pontificate and flap my lips about being. Because I told you, talking about success is, is it, it, it's like, it's a social thing. It's like smoking dope in the 60s. I mean, it's something you do. You talk about being successful. I want to be more successful. And later on today and tomorrow, we're going to talk about that pay price to action that, that George Verdure talked about. You know, 
we're not willing to pay that price for various reasons. Oh, take it away from that, yeah, okay, put it over here. So, I mean, the enemy is here and it is us. Now, one of the things that I meant to say, instead of this, for those of you that have forgotten, because I know a lot of you, again, you know, whoops, that's a piece of paper here. Yeah? <laughs> it's as good as putting this up. You know, instead of this, you know, worrying about this, as Peter Drucker aptly pointed out in one of his 25 or 30 books, I want you to become a monomaniac, that's his word, which is a leader with extreme passion, desire, and vision. Passion, desire, and vision, ladies and gentlemen, didn't say anything about details, does it? No. Doesn't say anything about being a micro manager. Doesn't say anything about signing checks. Doesn't say anything about buying inventory. Doesn't say anything about any of that crap that you do every day. Rick Scott is a monomaniac. He is a leader with extreme passion, desire, and vision. He probably doesn't even have signing authority. I know he doesn't have signing authority to his company. I know he doesn't. And as you've already heard me say, as Tom Peters said, we want you to become a management by wandering around. We want you to, just as I do when I come in and help companies, I wander around, I have lunch with this, I have dinner with this, etc. Wandering around. Management by wandering around isn't being a detail-oriented person. And I don't know how you pronounce M-B-W-A, Lula, or... As opposed to that global thinker worrying about all that other junk that doesn't mean anything. Okay. Now, to accomplish what we've talked about yesterday and up through this morning, you have to go through a cleansing process of clarifying your vision. Part of clarifying your vision is where you really want to go. Goals. What you, what's really important to you. If making a quantum leap in your business or in your life is not important to you, most of what I've said today and yesterday it doesn't mean anything to you, and for sure what I'm about to say, it means less than nothing to you. But it's about, you're gonna have to clarify your vision because to become laser beam focused, that's exactly what it means. Laser beam focused on the few things, not the many. You don't have to know how you're going to get there, but you need to know where you want to go. I used the example yesterday. John Kennedy, in his infinite wisdom, the day he was inaugurated, 1960, when he pointed at the moon and said, in this decade, within this decade, we're going to put a man on the moon, land him safely, and bring him, uh, bring him back, and do it before the Russians. There was no NASA. We didn't have any rocket ship that could take more than a 200-pound payload off the ground. There was spit, nothing. But he knew where he wanted the country to go. And coincidentally, in October something, 1969, we landed a man on the moon. When the 30-foot broad, uh, not, they don't call it broad jumper. I still like broad jumper a lot better than long broad jumper. And when the 30-foot long jumper is thinking about the 30-foot line, that's all he's thinking about, the mark. Hitting the mark, 30 feet. When I set my goals for two billion and the highest paid energy executive, I mean, there was a lot of things. I had $820, I was sitting in a house, not the house I live in now. You know, uh, in, in Palos Verdes, Rancho Palos Verdes, with a lease fax machine, uh, a phone, and a screaming kid that had just been born. Dan Jr. had just been born. But a lot of things happened. When Rick Scott started or acquired his first healthcare company, he wanted, his, his goal was to, to dominate and control the healthcare business in the United States. Now, that's a pretty big deal from a boy from TCU. That's pretty, that's pretty global in thought. When, when the mouth from the South, Ted Turner said, 
was told by his daddy, Ted, set goals you cannot accomplish in your lifetime. Not much infrastructure in that. We have to be clear on what we want to do and where we want to go. But we don't necessarily have to know how we're going to do it. If you can imagine it, you can achieve it. If you can dream it, you can become it. You're going to hear a lot about this for over the next hour. One good thing about being young, well, not too many things good, but this is maybe the only thing, is that you are not experienced enough to know you cannot possibly do the things you are doing. I used to give a graphic example of that, but I, I cut it out, but I think I'm going to put it back in here. I think this group is probably just above the doofus level that can remember it. You don't know that, you know, that the sexual organs aren't supposed to function six or seven times in a night when you're young. See? But they do. They can. You can make that quantum leap. Leaps. Leaps. Exactly. But as you get older, you know that that, that ain't possible. It's not natural. It's not whatever. Pennyism, the consequence of a misguided decision is de minimis in the concept of eternity. Another way of saying that, anything that you ever did in your lifetime, except for the two physicians, if, considering that it was life and death, anything you've done in your whole lives, heretofore and in the future, in the cosmos of time is not a fart in the wind. Nothing you have ever decided, nothing you have ever done, no decision, no person you ever fired, no person you ever hired, no decision, nothing you have ever done in your miserable life is more than a fart in the wind. Yet you ponder, pontificate, Lotus 1, 2, 3, business decisions to death. And I ask you why. You don't, ha don't believe me. Don't answer me. Because you don't have a reason why. Nothing in your lives. And once this doctor gets into the, the he won't, probably won't be making any of those kind of decisions anymore. Pretty soon for him, nothing that you've ever done or will do. That I know people in this room, because I, I have the misfortune of knowing some of you personally. <laughs> some people in this room beat to death decisions. When I leave with my wife to go to dinner, normally I eat the same restaurant every night, but to the extent we go out to dinner. And I don't, we just get in the car and I drive. And it, it's a restaurant that used to be an Italian restaurant for 20 years, and now it's a Greek restaurant or something. And I don't care. I just keep, because I know I can always get a table. The local mafia own it up on the hill. And I, you know, not too many people eat there. Because I don't care the mafia owns it. They bother me. I don't bother them. They don't bother me. But I know I can always get a table. So I eat, you know. I don't think about, well, should we go to the west side or should we do a Spago's or whatever the, these Vogue restaurants? I just want food to put in my belly. I don't care. Just think about all the time you waste on all this superfluous crap in your life. Forget about right or wrong. Why worry? Just recognize and seize opportunities. Conventional wisdom tells you just the opposite. Conventional wisdom says, you know, detail-oriented people, that's good. And just think about it. conventional wisdom are the most people. Most people in life are poor. Just think about that. Most people that write books are poor. Most people that teach you at school are poor. Most people that do everything for you are poor. I may be the only person that has ever talked to you that's rich. Because here, it's going to be where the impossible isn't and nobody's going to tell you it isn't. Because virtually everything that you told me yesterday afternoon is possible, depending on the level of commitment that you're willing to make. This young man talked about going and actually wearing down his boss. 
into hiring them, right? And I remember when I when I um, left Payne Weber and went to Bear Stearns, I wanted to take my major institutional accounts with me. And one of them was TWA Pension Fund, as I recall. And I couldn't get a hold of the guy because basically he was, he was not taking my phone calls. So I went to where he lived. I flew to the city where he lived. I parked my car in his driveway and I went to sleep. He had to wake me up for me to move my car before he could put his drive into his, uh, his, his uh, little estate in Connecticut. Six, seven, eight hours later, some guy's kicking at my door and it's him, his name is Jim. He said, what are you doing here, Pena? I said, I need to talk to you. And he says, well, I've already made my decision. I'm, but I said, no, you're not listening. I need to talk to you. If after I talk to you, you still decide that, obviously I'll honor your wishes. Make a long story short, obviously. 10 hours later, five in the morning, he decided to move the big institutional account from Payne Weber to Bear Stearns. I would have stayed there, didn't make any difference. It was my biggest account. I would have stayed there till the 12th of dawn. He represented 40% of my income. There was no way on God's green earth I was leaving there. Remember, I had a 94.6 close ratio, ratio when I sold real estate. There was no way that this fish was getting off the hook. I would have done whatever it took. Didn't make any difference. I wasn't going to do my best. When I, when I flew there, and of course, Pharaoh Stern said, we're not paying for your expenses. We're not doing anything. Baby. I said, I'm coming back with TWA, or I'm going to die there. You represented 40% of my income. There was no way. Most people in this room have been taught to fish. You put a string with no bait on it. Some of you, a few of you fish with a, a hook. Some of you with no bait on it. Some of you fish with a hook with a, with, with a piece of something on it. I fish with nets. <laughs> That's what quantum thinking is all about, fishing with nets. Not putting your finger down there and hoping some damn trout is going to bite it. Setting goals and objectives. You are already done this many times before, but remember, it costs nothing to aim high. <clears throat> Napoleon Hill said that. Pennyism, always shoot for the moon. That way you're at least, uh, if you don't hit the bullseye, you're going to get 80%. Uh, um, Deanne Verdero said, uh, shoot for the moon and at least you'll hit a star, which she had explained to me because stars are farther than the moon. But I, wanna, I don't want to get into the physics of the deal, but I guess if you miss the moon and the, the rocket, like our rockets, would go and hook on a star. But th the point is, the only reason we don't, expe we don't set higher goals is because of our low expectations, because we basically think that we're all dirt bags. We don't feel good enough about ourselves. We don't have enough self-esteem, self-worth, and self-concept to think that we do better, can do better. And to the extent that we've achieved any success, it's because we've been fortunate. See, most of us in this room don't really believe they could achieve the same success that they've attained to date. Now, Judy Cook, who's a psychiatrist who I alluded to either today or yesterday, if she were here, I'd ask her, because she, she's, she's too busy making money now to follow me around in the country like she used to, but she, she, she would say in a very articulate way, and she'd go through it, you know, like a psychiatrist does, that that's basically it. And she could go into why you were breastfed too much, too little, your mother did it, all this, you, you, you wore uh, uh, diapers too long. I mean, there's all kind of reasons she gives, but you're all crap in my judgment. <laughs> but anyway, but she, she'd walk you through that. And for those of you that have been at a seminar where Judy Cook was there, uh, the, but the bottom line is, the reason that our ex we, we, we have low expectations of ourselves because we're not so sure, or we're, some of you are positive that you couldn't do it again. Just as I'm positive, I could, and I have. I've been dead financially five times. I've been reincarnated. In fact, I saw a program on TV the other day. I didn't know what a channeler was exactly. Channeler, you know, somebody else's uh, being is channeled through them and they start talking all kinds of different languages or whatever. And, um, the, um, and they've lived you know, one time, he was an uh, ancient, uh, emperor and this and that, and I've, I've had psychics work with me, and they said that I was a, uh, a pharaoh, wasn't I? 
I went I was a pharaoh one time. I like that. My, uh, my wife just walked in, but well, I was a pharaoh and I must have had a lot of wives. And then they also said that Linda has always been, even when I was a pharaoh, she was my number one wife. <laughs> my number one wife. That was a smart psychic. Yeah, she, and so, but um, it's because we don't feel good about ourselves. You know, and, 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 and as I said, by Saturday afternoon, Saturday early evening, you're going to be able to pinpoint why you haven't achieved more. You heard Rick Scott say, I pushed him into having the self-confidence. George and Deanne said it a little differently, but basically said the same thing. See, I know you can do it. I know the Doofus brothers back there, Jim and John, can do it. I know better than they know. I know that. Leanne Zakelli, who's been my administrative assistant until just recently, is now the CEO of one of my companies. I, turned, I fired the, the stupid moron that was the inventor, one of our Hispanic brothers. Tried to, every time I try to go back to the Hispanic community and do something good, I get... <laughs> and, and so I had, to, you know, I had to fire this guy's ass. And, 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 and when I fired him on the phone, he didn't understand. I had to fly back from wherever I was. I met him at the Crown Room, which is the... Um, the, was something for Delta. Delta Airlines, and as I'm with Fidel was there, as I'm choking the guy like this and screaming at the top of my lungs, the the manager of the crown room came over, real nice little lady, and she comes and says, "Excuse me, sir, I'm I'm literally like this," and he says, "Uh, because uh, I said I'm gonna kill your ass," and I'm screaming and yelling at him. He says, "Could you please hold it down?" Is the people complaining because of the uh, foul language? I turned around and told her to go, you know where, and then the security came in, and then a little security guy's wearing, you know, a flashlight, and, and I told these three guys, I said, you better bring some bigger security, you, you three little doofuses think you're going to get me out of this crown room, you're crazy. So then, after I got done with the guy, we're walking to the door, they're escorting me, now they brought in a bunch of people, they're escorting me to the door, and I turned to the manager of the uh, Delta Airlines there, and I said, um, have you ever met the chairman of... Um, Delta Airlines? And he says, no, I haven't. I said, well, his favorite word is MFR. Does everybody know what MFR is? <laughs> yeah. And I walk out the door. <laughs> we do not feel good about ourselves. Set high goals. I told you earlier, add three or four, five zeros and multiply times 10. And always, always, always pay yourself first. What does that mean? One of the reasons I have as much money as I do is I paid myself through the whole cycle. I didn't wait. Some of you keep the money, retained earnings, and then pretty soon the cycle's over, and you're trying to sell the business, and you try to sell it for more than it's worth, or what, more, what you think it's worth, which is normally what the, the, uh, the rest of the world doesn't think it's worth, and you don't come to a satisfactory sales price because you've, you, you, you've got to squeeze the last dollar out of it. If you pay yourself from the beginning through the whole cycle, I used to pay 15% of pre-tax profits to my employees and bonuses. 15%. Always. Bonuses from 40 to 200% were not uncommon. And I used to pay myself a lot of money. Every time we did a deal, I paid bonuses. So at the end of the cycle, now the company supposedly may be I mean, bid for now, and I'm still the largest individual shareholder. I mean, the executives that are negotiating the deal don't feel obligated that they're going to have to squeeze out the last dollar because they've gotten rich for the last 10 years. And what happens is when you try to sell your business or your practice or whatever, you try to squeeze because you haven't paid yourself enough. Well, I say there's two reasons to pay yourself first. And when I mean you, I mean everybody in the whole chain, from the chairman, from the owner, the entrepreneur, down to the person that washes your car. Because then, one, you don't have to squeeze the last dollar out and it's going to be easier to sell. And two, if the cycle never comes, at least you've gotten made a lot of money in the meantime. Some of you have already missed the cycle to sell your businesses. I told you, if you're over 40 years old and you've got a business, the next up cycle, blow your business out because you may not live long enough for another cycle. If you're over 40, just blow it out. Whenever your business is in vogue, Get rid of it. Because trust me, it isn't going to stay in vogue forever.
Goals expand your awareness of opportunities. People tend to pay attention to what's happening in direct proportion to the value it has, been, it has to them. Pay value. Goals stimulate creativity. We're going to get more into depth about setting goals in a few minutes. But those are the, that meander through life just practicing medicine, practicing law, going to work, being an accountant, whatever, that haven't set goals, definable goals, not with time frames, and I'm going to talk about that, are just, they're, they're like uh, the meandering river that just where, wherever there's a hard place, it, it, it goes away from, I mean, football teams, athletes have goals. They have definable goals. I want to run this fast. I want to do this. I want to, uh, you know, uh, lead the league in, in defense. I want to lead the league in offense. I want, all, all, all these things, large corporations, virtually all public corporations, set goals, set parameters so they can tell the shareholders. Yet so many small businesses, small to medium-sized businesses, have no goals. They, they, they just meander. And the few that have goals are so, they're based on such low expectations because the self-worth of the owner or the whole staff is so low that they're almost as good as not having goals. I would have, rather have lousy goals than no goals, but it's not much better having lousy goals. And the thing that you're going to learn is I would have rather have a mediocre goal program that is enforced with enthusiasm or practiced with enthusiasm well, then the greatest goal program that's mediocrely is, is, is uh, backed in a mediocre way. You give me a guy or a gal that's average, is an enthusiastic person, and I'd rather have that than all the Ivy League degrees, MBAs, PhDs. There's no comparison. There's just none. I'm a prime example. I don't have that kind of education. But I'm a formidable opponent. You can bet your sweet ass on that. You better give your soul to God, because. Yes, sir. How high is your education? I have a, a bachelor's of science from a state university here. Period. And I, I, I have 24 or 26 units out of 30 towards my master's in finance. I stopped going to graduate school, as I said earlier. I commuted from San Diego to Los Angeles where I went to graduate school at UCLA and Cal State Northridge. You couldn't go to two schools at the same time. They, it was against the law, but I did anyway. And I didn't get in trouble until I had the same professor at both schools. <laughs> Dr. Shirley Teeter, still alive, God bless her. Linda remembers her. And I was taking two classes from her. She said, you know, you, you can't do this, Dan. And, but anyway, I did it. But I dropped out of school because I, I, I was making like 10 grand a month. And I was paying $11.60 on PSA to go back and forth to school. And I bought, had my first rolls, and my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, were, were driving around in a big silver cloud. And I figured maybe it's not that important for me to, you know, finish my master's in finance. Because in 1971, 10 grand a month, a lot of money. And, and I had a scholarship to go to law school, which I never went. And I talked to one of my best friends. He's in the back of the room to go to law school. Instead, he's a lawyer, and I'm not. Which he hasn't forgiven me all these many years. But, uh, so that's my education, uh, but um, the, um, I often wonder, not, I don't often wonder, I wonder every once in a while when I'm do, doing one of these and I have uh, people that have that kind of education, what would have happened to me if I had gone to Harvard or I had gone to a Stanford, got a Stanford MBA at, at the Castle Seminar, I don't know if it was Burl, Stan Davis, in fact I think he's the president of the Stanford MBA alumni or whatever, he said, he said, Dan, in six days here, he says, you know, uh, he, well, actually he said, one day here I learned more than I learned from my MBA at Stanford. And, uh, and, and Ted Nicholas, and that's not why I say he's one of the only good guys that's given <clears throat> seminars, but Ted Nicholas, who's attended that seminar, I mean, Ted is a savvy guy, he's made a lot of money, he's considered, you know, arguably the, one of the best copywriters in the country, maybe the world. He said, you know, he says 103, I've never asked him what 103 things he learned from me, but the, um, but I mean, all my knowledge is based on all the mistakes I've made. And those are the people that you want to go talk to. Those are the people you want to interface with. Those are the people you want to hang around with. Made a lot of mistakes. Jerry Orman in the back of the room was one of my mentors. He's made a lot of mistakes in all business. 
And one time he says, I've made every one that is possible. So he helped me not to make those. Costa Grazos, uh, who I'm going to talk about in a little while, who's another one of my mentors, he was the CEO of NASA Shipping Lines. He made so many mistakes, him and Ari Onassis, he's, damn, we made hundreds and thousands of mistakes. So th that's where you benefit from listening to somebody that's made a lot of mistakes. You know, it, 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 the, the individual that's only had successes in his life, first of all, he, he doesn't have too much money. <laughs> but, and uh, it just, that's the kind of individual that you want to listen to, man or woman. Look at it this way, ladies and gentlemen. You're not supposed to be concerned about what happens in the middle of a jump. You're supposed to be thinking about where you're going to land. Again, vis-a-vis -vis your company, I told George and Deanne, I think they should easily have a $100 million company, didn't I? I told Rick's, um, what the, what's this, Chief Ty, what's, uh, what's his last name? Smith. Smith, that we talked to on the phone. And actually, his business could be, e I think, e more easily a $100, $100 million business. They're going to do it first because he's too cheap. <laughs> I mean, there's no question. And unless something happens to him, you know, unless he dies and his, his, his team takes, takes his company to the next level or something. Because even with all the changes, he could still do a lot more, you know. He probably has to have a, a resuscitator at night when he goes home, thinking all the money he spent. Uh, pardon? What does he do? Uh, George, you explain the business. It's uh, called News USA, and he, he has, uh, every week or every two weeks, he puts out a, a newspaper, camera-ready articles for newspapers. Now, uh, in your packet, you should have one of these forms. <clears throat> this is a form I developed not when I was first starting, because I wasn't into developing forms. I've only actually put it, memorialized it in recent years because people ask me when I go through the goal setting process. Does everybody have one of these? Yeah. And it, it basically talks about the goal. It says key result. It talks about the champion and co-champion. That's NBA bullshit terminology for the, the, the individual that, that, that came up with the idea. And if there's a co-champion, that means there's two people. Uh, and the, uh, normally the idea is going to be yours, though. So there won't be any co-champion. Um, and it talks about milestone. In other words, the events, that need to, things that need to take place for the, the, the goal to come to fruition. You know, obviously, if you you want to break the four-minute mile, you got to run 420 first, and then, you know, and then 410, and the, and 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 I put in there a a, a a a date column. I don't really use dates though, and I'm going to explain that to you why I don't use dates. Because dates are instead of a floor for you, they're a ceiling. I said I was going to go public and retire to by the time I was 40. I did it on my 39th birthday. What if I had said I was going to do it as soon as I humanly possibly could? None of the big guys have time frames. Set goals you can't accomplish in your lifetime. The mouth from the south, Teddy Turner. Not set goals when you're 32, 26, 48, 50, 60, 80, or 200, or whatever. 
Now, I, I, I didn't realize that early on. I now realize it. But for the people that work for you or work with you, you're going to say, I want, I want the, um, the quarterly numbers by the 15th of the following month. I mean, if you, it, it does, you know, unless you have exceptional, exceptional people, you know, they'll, they, they're not going to do it as humanly as, as possible, as quick as possible. When we had our monthly numbers and we had very sophisticated internal uh, financial auditing capabilities at Great Western Resources. Originally, well, I used to get the monthly numbers on the 22nd, and then I keyed bonuses one year to them getting to me as quickly as possible. Then I got them, the quickest I ever got them was on the 12th. So we had 10 days that, you know, they, they did them faster. And then I gave the controller a $75,000 bonus, I think. <coughs> And all of a sudden, Shukas, the Shuk, as we called him, I mean, all of a sudden, he found a way to get him done quicker. <laughs> it's funny how it works, you know? And we didn't have soft lights and music, you know, the theory X, Y, and Z. And I happened to meet Dr. Ochi, who's the, th uh, the proponent, the uh, inventor of theory Y, X, Y, or excuse me, three Z. X, Y, and Z is management by hit him in the head, caveman, management by soft lights and positive strokes and you're okay I'm okay bullshit and, and and the other one is the Japanese where they jump in jacks and everybody's a team and which we now doesn't work forever like nothing works forever and I had the uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Ochi is the ch uh, chief of staff for Mayor Reardon here in town he's the one that came up with that deal he's a he's a, um, a PhD uh, Japanese uh, descent um, at UCLA on leave of absence he's the chief of staff but at the end of the day it's this at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, and in the middle of the day, it comes down to this. It always has, always will. Rick Scott pays his people a lot of money. All the rest is superfluous baloney. For those of you who can't see, that's a dollar sign. Talks cheap, takes money to buy whiskey in Electra, Texas. I paid my people a lot of money, and they, until the shareholders decided to get rid of me, they, were, they, they, they walked through, not on fire, they walked through fire. It's that simple. There's no great mystery. It's not like you see these programs, you know, uh, mm -hmm. beyond, the, the, I mean, all these, uh, these spooky programs you see on the, it's nothing spooky or psychic about it, it's that. And all the rest is baloney. So when you're working with these forms, it's, and you review your goals periodically. Now, Linda and I, who my wife is sitting in the back now, we've been keeping our goals and writing them down. And we, we normally use between East, or Christmas and the New Year's, like here's 1983 goals. And we write them on whatever. You know, we used to write them on napkins at a restaurant. And, and some of the really nice printed ones, like this, 1987, my wife printed out. Uh, but like, uh, in 1983, I wanted to make, I wanted to have a personal income of $500,000, a Rolls Royce, a Jeep. I wanted to give my dad a 65-year birthday party. I wanted to uh, give Linda another ring and uh, uh, renew our vows on our 10th anniversary, which we did. I wanted to go to Rio. I wanted to buy a building in Beverly Hills. I wanted to give my two partners each a million dollars that they didn't expect from me. Um, let's see what else. I wanted to get a new plane. I was into planes in those days. 1984, we wanted to stay abroad. Now, we made this, this, this goal, this is Linda's writing. On Christmas to New Year's of 83, we moved in the castle in September 84. A state abroad. We also wanted a mansion, 15 to 20,000 square foot in the house, or I mean in the U.S. Grounds, pool, dog area, children's play area, library, dining room, billiard room, built-in bar, med oh, master bedroom, spa in it. We wanted to go to Tahiti together. We've never gone to Tahiti, we? <laughs> we got all the rest. Uh, 1987, I wanted to be in the American Business Hall of Fame. Cover of National Magazine, top 50 um, 
exploration production companies in the United States, loving and caring parent. I was into that that year, I guess. Also, loving and caring husband. Um, I wanted to be the most successful U.S. Latin businessman of all time. <clears throat> I wanted to give a million dollars away to charity. Let's see, I don't need to talk about the peccadillo I wanted. Uh, my wife's in the back now, but anyway, 16-year-old peccadillo. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to get an elephant, a lion, a leopard, and record book quality. I did all those things, except for the um, uh, most. Well, I, at that time, I probably was the most successful business, U.S. Latin businessman of all time. But and we keep track of these things, and. The problem, at age 39, I had accomplished all of them because I had set goals that were too low. I retired to Scotland, and if it wasn't for Charlie dying on me, we may still be there. But that forced me to come. It didn't force me. I didn't, nobody put a gun in my head. I came back to work January of 80, 87 when he died, at age 40. So people ask me often, I'm interviewed, what would you do over, if you had your whole life to do over again, what would you do? Only one thing different, I'd set my goals higher. Nothing else. Nothing else. Because, see, when you set goals, you really don't believe you're going to accomplish them. That's why you set such low ones. Because it's easier to wiggle off the hook when you don't perform. <clears throat> and see, high performance people look at it just the opposite. We know we're going to, you know, in fact, Ted Turner, and now my life's changed. I didn't think the mouth from the South could ever change my life. But now I've set goals, some goals that I don't want to plan on accomplishing in my lifetime. Big difference than my 6% rate of return. You know, I'd rather die. I'd rather be dead than run a business that's growing at 6%. It's kill me, you know. Put me asleep. Dan Jr. Wood, he's going to put me down like Driller. <laughs> I'd rather not do anything. I'd rather be a monk. No, I don't know. That's not true. I don't want to. I'd rather be uh, something else. But I mean, I gave a talk at CEO clubs not too long ago, six, eight, ten months ago, here in Los Angeles. And we're sitting before they have drinks. Uh, nobody drinks, has an open bar anymore. Nobody. But this organization does. And we're sitting there, and one of the CEOs, um, this is not the CEO, said that he's lost 60% of his net worth in the last three years that it took him 40 years to build. That's another guy. He should have blown his brains out, that guy right there. But th there are people there that, and this goes back to why you want to hang around with successful people. They, they were all telling, who could tell the worst horror story of how much money they lost around this table at lunch? Oh, you don't know anything. I had an employee who hired this lawyer and had to pay him $11,000 to write this thing, and then we never acquired the company. My God. And they're going around horror stories, you know. These are, these are guys that have net worths. These guys aren't poor. And it becomes debilitating. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, one of the reasons I like, other than I like Jerry Orman, I like to play over at Bel Air Country Club because they have more retired Fortune 500 CEOs at Bel Air than any place in the country. And whenever I play with Jerry, I mean, there's at least a couple retired Fortune 500 CEOs in the foursome. And this Jerry and myself, and that means the other two are Fortune 500 CEOs. You know? You know that 80, excuse me, 74% of the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies all have something in common. That's right, and it's not Marines like Nicholas uses because he was a Marine, it's military. They have military backgrounds. 74% of all Fortune 500 CEOs, and there's only one woman, Fortune 500 CEO, had military backgrounds. Duh, I wonder why. Goal-oriented, disciplined. Passion, follow me, I'm the infantry. Watch the spirit of the bayonet to kill. And you wonder why you don't make any money. 
When I, when I was in San Diego, commuting back and forth while I was going to graduate school, and Linda, my wife, used to, she used to drive down from Long Beach where she taught and drop in. I thought I'd come down and have dinner. I said, Linda, it's a long drive. But the people that I hired, I went over to the naval base in San Diego and I hired 16 Top Gun guys that just got out of the military. Bill Clarahan, and uh, I used to call one Claremont. I can't, I can't think of their names now. Because these guys, these guys, see, you couldn't tell these guys. Bad at four or five or six Gs, the wings come off. They do. <laughs> and you can't tell these guys that because they've flown them at that. <coughs> you can't, you know, these guys, couldn't, you couldn't tell them. It's a recession in 1971. You can't sell real estate, but you got nothing else to do. You just got out of the you know, Navy. They give you three or $4,000 when you got out to the back pay and stuff. So I hired these guys. It and then Clarence was the stupidest of the group, and it became infectious. Then they all made sales. I think I went through 12 or 13, at least 10 cars. I went from a Volkswagen to a 250 Mercedes to a Cadillac Eldorado convertible to a Fleetwood Brougham to a, I forget all the, then I uh, then a, a limo and a Silver Cloud. I was just buying cars and because we were all going nuts. Because nobody told us we couldn't do it. I set such high goals. I said, we have to, this division has to produce more sales than the whole nation. Well, Penny says, fine, we can do that. And we did. Your expectations, most people's expectations, are so low. Because again, high performance people feel good about themselves. High performance people know you can buy a one, one or two or four million dollar house and make the payments. I don't know what my monthly overhead is, but I know it's probably bigger than almost every company in this room. That's my personal overhead. I don't know what it is. And I was teasing my wife. I was going to call her accountant and find out how much money my wife is spending. Till you don't want to do that, Dan. I don't know. I don't care. Like I tease my mom, I haven't worked in three years. I don't count, count this working. I haven't worked in three years. I don't, that's nice. We don't care. Linda's expectations, I believe, and if I'm wrong, Linda, you speak up, are that I, I'm always going to make enough money or have enough money for us to do what we do. She doesn't worry about that. <coughs> it's all about expectations. And when you sit down with your people or yourself or your spouse or your significant other, whatever the hell you call them or her, it's critically important that when you're setting goals, that you set them with extremely high expectations, not low expectations. John, you had a question, and I just ignore you. Well, yeah, I, I was Probably, I ignore you because I know it's you, I know. but uh, go ahead. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, the mic. You know, if we were this, this was a Jay Abraham thing. We'd have a bunch of doofuses running up the, the things. Oh, here, here, here's the mic. Here's the mic. Well, no, my my question was simple. If you had to do it all over again, every time you read those goals, would you have never attained any of them? So, well, uh, yeah, that may be true. I would have set a lot of goals. Um, if I had it all to do all to do over again, I may not have any kids because I, I, a lot of my stuff. Now, all my stuff virtually works in business, but I'm not as successful with my children. Of course, my wife says it's because you don't apply them the same way. See, whereas I'll sit and I'll listen to your doofus problem and I'll work with you and I'll say, blah, blah, blah. my kids, get it done, you know, and I, I don't do that. You know, I don't work with them and say, well, listen, tell me this and tell me that. I, you know, I just expect them because they got my blood running through their veins that they ought to be able to do it. And it doesn't work that way, see? And I'll spend hours and take calls and spend hours with doofuses to call me all the time. And Dan, Derek will come in and he'll sit there, I'm busy now. And Dan will come in, but Dan doesn't even come in anymore. Kelly will come in and I says, Daddy, Daddy, can I read your story? No, I can't. You know, not me read her story, her read me a story. <laughs> no, I don't have time, I don't have time. And so I'm not, I, I'm not as good. So the, the goals that I would set now would be infinitely uh, bigger. Uh, I probably would have gotten into this business a lot of years before uh, because uh, basically there really isn't any competition. We still haven't gotten a success formula, but I can assure you there's no competition. You've heard a lot of people doing this. You never heard anybody like me, you never will, unless you hear me again. 
if, if Carl or Gates or one of those guys goes into this business, I'm retired. I only want to do it as long as I'm the most successful. When I'm not, my but a unique, uh, what are you, a USP or unique selling proposition, whatever the hell uh, Jay says, that's my unique selling proposition. There isn't anybody else. <laughs> there just isn't. You know, that's as unique as you can get. I'm it. You know, as my as, as, as my old caddy used to say, you the man, you the man, you know? But I mean, I've set different kinds of goals. I don't know, uh, fortunately, Lynn and I have grown together. You know, not many people, I mean, we're an anomaly. We've been married, we've been married three times. We've renewed our, our vows twice. So I've been fortunate in that. You know, I don't know if I had set my goals differently, if I would have still met Linda and done all those things. So I don't know. But I, I can tell you this, for the next part of my life, I know that I, I, I'm doing it different. And just think about it. If I'm, see, I'm changing my formula. Everybody in this room <clears throat> would cut their left cheek off or sell one of their relatives to be where I am today. And I'm changing my formula. Think about that. Because high performance people react to change. Business and life is not static. Most people you know are. One of the primary reasons I don't have anything to do with my relatives, either side of the family. Talk about static. I'm changing my formula. The mouth from the South gave me the clue to set goals that you can't accomplish in your lifetime. The Verdiers would have never thought of acquisition, or if they thought of it, they couldn't do it, or whatever the reason, you know. But now look at them. You heard uh, uh, Casey. He, he considers himself a messenger.